All right, all right. JT, you're saying? I was just going to say that uh, for the first time in a very long time, I had to record a script on camera, and good God, I, it gives me more respect for the people who do it every week. Um, like, I'm not into the whole dress-up thing that a lot of, uh, you know, lefties and pseudo-lefties do on YouTube, but um, mm-hmm. it's, man, just sitting there and having to look into the lens and, and try to read off the teleprompter and not look like a robot, that's hard. That was not fun, but I, I even got the, uh, I did the bisexual lighting, like nice. the, uh, <laughs> the purple and bluish lighting in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very original. Yeah, so uh, we'll very, see how it turns very, out. I'm a fuck with you. Yeah. <laughs> not honestly, I disagree <laughs> yeah. with you I strongly because it's so much more difficult to, like, Think of what fucking video to put over certain parts of a script. Yeah, I waste funny. like three yeah. hours, like just walking around in the room in order to fill like 20, 30 seconds. But when you're recording your face, yeah. every single part of the video that you don't know what footage to put into, you just put your face. It, it's it's like the ultimate cheat code. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that was the reasoning. Like, my videos are getting longer. Like, this one's going to be like 25 minutes or something like that. And I was like, hey. man, I don't want to have to find 25 yeah. minutes of stock footage and Fox News <laughs> clips and stuff. So, I was... That was the reasoning, so I can, you know, default to showing my my ugly mug. Uh, yeah, and JT, of, you know, and JT the is Wall very, Street bull. And JT is very attractive compared to me and Hakeem that look like oh, piles <laughs> of shit that just got out of a man's <laughs> rectum. Uh, so why not do it? And also, like, the CIA knows who you are, so you should, like... Oh, yeah. You yeah, don't care no. about anonymity, so fuck it. I would have done what you did a long time ago if I was... Uh, public so good for you man good for you you're gonna get a lot of simps though so so get uh get ready i hope your your wife is prepared uh, for the <laughs> intense amounts of uh potential side uh, guys and girls <laughs> yeah. that you could be having so you know i'm gonna you start selling mistake, my bath water you made a mistake you go Nick. it's not simping when it's for jt <laughs> that's true. It's anything but mediocre. Entirely <laughs> justified. It's literal realism. Yeah, yeah. I keep forgetting <laughs> that the definition of simping implies that you are being overtly passionate about somebody who, at the end of the day, is innately mediocre. I, oh, like, really? I, yeah, I've I been brainwashed that. so much that simping is just when you like openly like someone. So we should all be <laughs> psychopaths and not exhibit <laughs> any sort of emotion towards anyone. Otherwise, simp. Uh, he been married died? for forty years. What a simp! What a simp! <laughs> <laughs> like, but it kind of got out of the lexicon at this point. Like, it's not. Yeah. It's, it's because white people popular. ruined it. Look, <laughs> it's, it's uh, what is the pipeline? It's the black woman to gay men to white women pi- pipeline, right? And then <laughs> yeah. eventually it enters all of society, and, and then afterwards it's ruined. Once, once it reaches the white guys, that the word's pointless. Yeah. Oh, Once Fox um, News gets a hold of it, oh god, it's over. Oh my god, Jesus Christ! Like there's some fucking, you know, uh, the stupid, the, the I'm not even gonna get get into tanky discourse as stupid as it is, oh, but yeah. that term, yeah. the second the liberals got a hold of it, anybody <laughs> yeah. who used it before, but either disparagingly or like as a point of endearment or whatever the fuck, fuck you for popularizing the term because now I have to look at fucking blue checks on Twitter, being like, oh, what a tanky thing Biden said. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, well, fuck. Yes. God. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck oh me! Yes. and we so all knew it was going to happen. We were watching this like they're going to yeah. pick this up. They're going to get it. Yeah. You, you Fartlow is going to get it. Somebody, yeah. <laughs> oh. no. you know, Ted Cruz has been somewhat of a tanky. Really, is, is Ted Cruz oh. a tanky? <laughs> <My God. laughs> Apparently, oh, fuck fucking Jessica yeah. says so. Oh. But uh, yeah, yeah. Speaking speaking of like tanky shit, like uh, I don't know if you guys have that problem because uh, I do every time like. My girlfriend is very social, so people tend to come around, but as compared to me, she's not as organized. Oh my God, she's listening to this. I'm not going to get late for a month. <laughs> but she tends to like invite people over like, oh yeah, come over, no problem. And like in 15 minutes, uh, they come from their part of town and boom, they're in my apartment. So I have around 10 minutes to clear out all the insanely radical communist memorabilia that is all over the fucking living room uh, from Mushankas to Lenin's to uh, fucking uh, portraits of uh, Bakunin and shit so it's it's uh, it's, it's quite it's quite in your face 
The only thing I don't remove is these massive tomes, uh, which I'm very proud of, which are like, I don't know, 70 years old, of Marx and Engels. But the reason I'm like kind of sweaty right now as I'm sitting and recording this is because uh, one of her friends came over, so they do some pre-drinking before going out. So I, I had to remove all the shit, almost broke half of it. And then they left after 20 minutes, so I had to put it all back in order to mm. get in the mood for the podcast. So I don't know if you guys are very <laughs> open with your friends about being uh, radical potential oh, yeah. terrorists or you're uh, <laughs> or you're fine or, or you're a poser just like myself in, in my life it's like either they know a hundred percent of Same. like how just how like lefty i am or they have no fucking idea Same. um i remember i, I keep my books don't you feel like batman like, like fucking batman with the other <laughs> ones like they don't know and like who the fuck like yeah that, that, that i i i'm sorry for interrupting you I, I, sometimes no, i have to admit i'm that meme with the guy sitting at the uh, like court corner of the room uh, yeah. <laughs> while everybody else is partying, but not with, ah, I have a podcast, I have a YouTube channel, but with, I would order half of you shot, you goddamn degenerate <laughs> bourgeois. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, Petty bourgeois, fuck it, yeah. Oh, <laughs> oh fuck me. Oh, I completely get it. What I was going to say is like, I, I, I kind of keep my books tastefully away so like if somebody wants to look at them they can but it's a bit it's enough out of the way that they start walking to it and they feel awkward um so they usually don't mm -hmm. uh but uh, i remember once i had a friend over i mean an acquaintance uh who later you on don't have any friends friend. except the two uh, of us exactly right <laughs> 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 so you, my soul 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 social interaction outside of the patients i finger um the prostate <laughs> the men not not the <laughs> don't take oh. it wrong i'm not sexually harassing my patients <laughs> I mean, the old men that need prostate exams. Is that what he's implying? <laughs> yeah, uh, that it's okay. Yes, yes. Oh, yikes. Yes. Anyways, um. <laughs> but what I was saying is, uh, uh, yeah, so this person came uh, over and they're looking at, the, they're like, oh, shit, your library. And then they go, they walk over to, to look at the books. And I keep the, the closest section to where people would walk to are my more, uh, you know, um, less offensive books, let's say. Mm -hmm. And you could see this yeah, person's Obama like interest and smile. Yeah. Oh God, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and yeah, I'm talking like, about it's Michelle. Generic... <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. It's it's Harry Potter and Obama. That's the liberal theory. Um, but yeah, oh. <laughs> and uh, you could see the smile and the like excitement just like melt away from their face because they're slowly like going through, and then they're like, okay, yeah, some like general history stuff, general, you know, uh, some economics. It was like, okay, that's interesting that you have that. And then they start seeing it was like Lenin, Lenin, Stalin, Marx, Lenin, <laughs> Lenin, Lenin. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then they start seeing like weird shit. Oh my god! Because I also have like you know biographies and stuff like that, but these people don't see it. So they like I have some I have a biography of Mussolini and Hitler. I have a, some stuff about the Japanese war crimes and Nazi stuff like history. And then they're looking at it it's like what the fuck? <laughs> Whose house did I enter? <laughs> and I'm like no 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 look look it's like op open up the covers please. And and I do this as a what's it called? Uh, mechanism of self-preservation in case anybody ever sees the fascist books in, in my library and I'm not there to give them the like hey I'm not that right they open up and the first cover I always write something like oh uh, thank god that the Soviets put these people in the dirt or some shit like yeah. this right <laughs> just so people realize I'm anti-fascist <laughs> oh, like, oh, I hide those. I have a book I, about. I have a few Nazi written by fascist books, but those are like I don't. Mm. I don't even know where they are right now. I was gonna say uh, uh, for you, go think. I have um uh, some book about uh, what's it called? Ethnic cleansing in the Balkans during uh, the Second oh, World War. Nice. And the first thing. Yeah, and the first uh, page I wrote uh, smart fascism sloboda uh, narodu just wow, in case bravo, just in case yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, just in case I'm not learning it. from these books no your enemy blah blah all that absolutely um, but yeah. what about you JT I everyone that I know knows I'm a, a dirty commie um, I, I've you know I used to kind of keep it close to the chest and then when mm. I switched my YouTube channel I'm like you know what I don't really care like these people are mm. my friends and I'll I'll share it with them and stuff and even people who are you know, acquaintances and stuff. If they ask about politics, I'll tell them, oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'll usually say socialist just to, you know, spare them the, the, <laughs> the horror of saying communist. But yeah, I mean, I keep my, my books mostly contained to my office. My Lenin bust is in my office. Um, <laughs> I've got, I love it. Uh, I've got some light magazines around the house for like family to pick up and stuff. I've got, mm. um, like Jacobin and current affairs and, you know, the real light stuff that they'll still think is, mm. is hardcore communism, which we would <laughs> consider <laughs> mostly liberal stuff these days. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm pretty open about it. And I think that's the, the best approach for, for normalizing it here in the States. It's just to be a normal person and, you know, 
not yeah. shove it down their throat, but just have it around. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Uh, I was going to say, by the way, because um, uh, JT, you've been married for uh, a while now. and uh, you seven years, you've, yeah. Yeah, mashallah. And uh, you, Gopnik, you've uh, been a, in a committed relationship also for a little while. But has it happened, you know, when you meet um, like a, part, uh, a potential interest and then the topic of politics comes up and then they're like, oh, like, where do you lie? And <laughs> you give them the, the, the tried and tested fucking <laughs> complete lies. Like, oh, I'm a little bit lefty. Just, yeah, I'm a little bit lefty sometimes. <laughs> so, so, Did you guys have to do that? Oh, absolutely. So many times. At, at one point, I completely started avoiding it. But people, especially mm. in this part of the world, bring up politics no matter what is going on. Uh, mm. Even in the most don't, don't mind the Tito bust. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I, at some point, I, I just started telling people. But the uh, same approach as JT with more like acquaintance type of people. Don't tell them, uh, you know, the full picture of uh, mm. how the restaurant you're we're all sitting and should be uh, managed by the waiters and by the kitchen staff. You know, <laughs> don't go into <laughs> into that fucking shit. But uh, but yes, that was definitely a hurdle. Actually, even in my current relationship, to to an extent. Like my girlfriend is extremely progressive, it's extremely anti-capitalist, anti-fascist, etc., etc. She's just—I've uh, talked about this 500 times about Eastern Europe. Just so influenced mm. by uh, a lot of uh, anti-communist propaganda that she's also kind of relatively scared of the term. But when I hear her mm. talk about uh, the world she would like to see built mm. and live in, it's literally what I'm telling you, woman. But she's like, but no, but the the the, 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 the gulags you know and i'm like ah fuck okay Uh, but i can live with that i can live with that all right and welcome back everybody to the d program uh today we'll be talking about yemen and particularly the yemen civil war and the the situation around that um, today will be a bit more, I don't want to say lectury, um, we'll still have like a, a discussion, but uh, uh, it will be mostly me leading this this conversation because I speak Arabic, I'm from the region, um, the, the token resident Arab will, will uh, have their say uh, at this point. Uh, we were hoping to get a guest actually for this, but uh, the few people that we reached out to, it kind of fell through, um, so I was like, okay, fuck it, then I'll just do it. Um, but yeah, with that <laughs> with that being said, I let's told talk you, JT, about Yemen. it was a good idea to have a token Arab. I fucking told you. <laughs> it's paying off, exactly. okay? You know what's funny enough? All of us on the podcast are pretty much token uh, uh, representatives of our respective cultures. <laughs> um, except so I, I, I represent Islam and, and, and uh, Arabs, um, and Yukopnik, he represents Balkans and Slavs, and uh, JT represents SpongeBob and whatever <laughs> else <laughs> American culture and is. Spider Man, <laughs> yeah. And Spider Man, exactly. SpongeBob and Spider Man. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Jesus. <laughs> was such Anyways. a good joke, man. Oh my god. Okay. Yes, yeah, go yeah, man. That was one of your best ever. Like literally oh my god. That Thank was you, uh, you're so sweet. Anyways, so yeah, man. Um this episode will also be a little bit heavier, so we're gonna try to inter- interject it with a bit of like, you know, light lightness, if that even is a fucking word, um, to keep it a bit yanny yeah, interesting. Anyways, so <clears throat> what is Yemen? Yemen is a country in uh, southern Arabia. Uh, it is uh, a country with a roughly population of around 30 million people. It's hard to, to estimate because there's barely a central government that can mandate things there. Um, it is an Arabic-speaking country and is by vast majority Muslim. Um, there are two major cities that you need to be aware of, uh, Sana'a and Aden. Sana'a was the uh, capital of what used to be North Yemen, and Aden is the capital of what used to be South Yemen. Uh, the modern capital was Sana'a until all this mess happened. It was then relocated to Aden, and now the uh, current central government of Yemen is actually in Saudi Arabia. They're a government in exile. We'll talk about all of this, don't worry. Um, but this is just the the uh, very, very basic um, geographic and, and uh, demographic knowledge you need to you Just, need just to know. for the for, for the racist listening, like, tell us, what are the Yemenis? Are they white, brown, dark brown, uh, fucking pink? That's a very, that, uh, that's yeah. a very uh, good question, actually. So oh, well, Yemenis okay. are an, <laughs> no, no, you, I'll, I'll mention why, actually. Um, Yemenis are an Arab people, right? And being Arab is not an ethnic thing and Arab is more of a uh, socio-cultural religious and linguistic characterization um, so they speak Arabic but if you were to look at their genetic backgrounds just like if you were to look at Palestinians or Algerians or Iraqis we're all very different but we all consider ourselves Arabs um, if you look at uh, so uh, Albanians okay exactly <laughs> exactly right <laughs> no they're um, the same you know, you, yeah 
Yeah, yeah, but funnily enough, yeah, there's there's a, a parallel you can kind of draw there. But anyways, so when you look at Yemenis, you notice that the Yemenis are actually um, darker than the average um, Arabs of the, uh, like the northern uh, Arab world and the western Arab world. Um, the reason is because they're very close to Somalia and Ethiopia and Djibouti and these other countries. So of course, there's been a lot of uh, mixing uh, in that regard. So you'll notice that a lot of them have more African features sometimes. And a, a lot of them also look um, somewhat Indian and even Asian a bit because there used to be a lot of trade uh, uh, with the Indian subcontinent, um, and as well as with uh, you know Indonesia, Malaysia, and those uh, um, Southeast Asian islands. Um, and as a result, you're going to see a very interesting, eclectic mix of people, all from people who are like, you know, uh, white, uh, you know, almost blonde, blue-eyed, yani Palestinian-looking, uh, to um, Habashi type, very uh, dark-skinned, um, uh, a um, African type of hair, etc., etc. Um, so that's something interesting for, for those people who might not know. Mm. A really uh, good place way, for Tinder, what? like fucking Tinder, would be super <laughs> fun. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, yeah, Iraq. By the way, just for like side interest, is actually very similar. Um, in the north of Iraq, there are many people who are much more, much uh, paler and have uh, lighter features. Southeast of Iraq, especially uh, around port places, you have people that are much darker. In my own family, for example, um, my father is very, very dark. My mother was very, very light, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, Arabs are not some weird monolith of just oh brown, <laughs> but whatever. Um, <laughs> So that's to what, just to jump in real quick, uh, for Americans listening, population-wise, uh, about the size of, uh, about the population of Texas. Texas is 29 yeah. million. Exactly right. And the size of the country itself is around Spain size, or Thailand. Either. Yeah. Those and for Eastern Europeans, uh, <laughs> three Serbias and or Bulgarias, <laughs> around 10 Croatias. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You know, it's 16.2 Montenegros. Yeah. <laughs> well, like that's like 7 million unit of measures. <laughs> Are there 7 million in Montenegro? No, no. It, it oh. would take 7 million Montenegros to have... Uh, there's there's oh, more see, Montenegrins see, see. living in Belgrade, Serbia, than in all of Montenegro. Yeah, I, would, I, I don't find that hard to believe. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> nah, 450, up to 550, okay. depending on sources. 1,000, not million. Okay. <laughs> That's very interesting. I had no idea. Okay, so the 16 point I is almost, roughly almost correct. Okay, anyways, um, <laughs> uh, the uh, general religious thing, this, I, I'm just going to get it out of the way because he, whenever you see any video made by, like, you know, some Western source about Yemen, the first thing they'll have is some shitty quote from somebody and they'll have something racist like, oh, dancing on the head of snakes, some... Mm. <laughs> Fucking, you know, and then you hear the the flying carpet music, the, <laughs> that fucking bullshit, right? It's yeah, uh, and then the yeah, first the brown thing be like, oh, on the yeah, screen, yeah, 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 the fucking the, yeah, the the overlay, the yellow filter, right? The like Orient like filter, Mexico, yeah, or Peru yeah. or whatever, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you can fucking smell uh, it. Like, it like, smells like nargile and spices. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and, and like chickens and like fresh chickens like just walking around uh, and somebody's say, like um, killing a chicken somewhere in the middle of the street always <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. and there's just some guy in the market going like blah, 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 blah. And, and there's, a, yeah, and there's a woman wearing a whale looking at a carpet and like touching it and yeah. like haggling what the, about the price oh. <laughs> and there's like little Anyways. very short kids <laughs> running and like pickpocketing people and then the camera <laughs> follows let, the pickpocket let me get kid this and it's running away started. and it's <laughs> running <laughs> away from and it's running away from like guards that are trying to catch it and the kid tries to hide and Have jumps muffled, like into muffled. through this window and then oh all of a sudden it's like some rich guy's uh, harem and there's yeah. like 20 ladies yeah, yeah. and they start dancing and it's a music video this is literally yeah, a oh music God. video from the Balkans I'm not yeah. even fucking kidding yeah. <laughs> you, know, you say that funny enough I had a video recommended to me of some Balkan thing I think the song was called Habibi but it was just like a, a guy <laughs> in like fucking I don't know, in, dobre, in Sarajevo so or something yeah, it's a, maybe, I think it's Bulgarian. Maybe. It's fucking classic. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's just I'm like, what the fuck is? <laughs> but fine, whatever. At least, hey, uh, the, the word "habibi" is so pleasant, let it spread across the land. My point mm -hmm. being, let's get to the fucking thing. <laughs> the the usual this weird racist thing always starts with, oh, Yemen is an ancient land with deep fucking uh, what's it called? Religious different. Blah, blah. This is a very very overplayed point about the um, Yemeni reality. Um, the Two major, the, the major religion is Islam, of course, and the major um, group within Islam is Sunni Islam, uh, majority of people, around 60%, roughly, while 40% are Shiite, but not the usual Shiite that you hear of. Um, there is Zaydi Shiite, which uh, there are three major branches of Shiism. There is Twelvers, which is basically the type of Shiites we have in Iraq and Iran. Um, there are uh, Zaydis, um, which are the ones you have in Yemen, and then you have Ismailis, which are all over, basically. Um, 
and they have their own like uh, intricacies, but we're not going to get into those. The point being, though, the idea that there's some kind of, you know, uh, oh, it's incre uh, deeply ingrained uh, uh, differences because of the religious tension. This is nonsense. Um, there is some truth to it sometimes, uh, but there are many mixed families in, in Yemen, just like there are many mixed families in Iraq where like a mom is Shiite and a dad is uh, Sunni, etc., etc. So just that point aside. Um, the point of why, why Yemen has kind of been in turmoil is because it's incredibly geostrategically important uh, for two reasons. Number one, Yemen, like most Arab countries, is very rich in oil and natural gas. So uh, as you may imagine, that's lucrative. But another thing is that for before the advent of, of you know, uh, oil excavation and all that kind of stuff, um, it was a very important um, trading post. Um, as you can imagine, it is right there when you need to stop any ship coming either for, for example, back in the day going around um, South Africa and up, uh, or when you're going through the Suez Canal down, you're going to have to stop somewhere and Yemen is a perfect place uh, to do so. So uh, very important for world trade um, uh, lines and uh, for shipping uh, and uh, other associated um, uh, purposes. With that being said, though, um, as a result of these tumultuous uh, happenings. Uh, the uh, Yemeni people have been affected by a devastating civil war that we're going to get into the details of in history and all that. Uh, that has killed, depending on where you uh, see your sources, between ten, a few, ten, uh, some tens and some hundreds of thousands of people, uh, depending on you measure it, uh, with millions more being displaced. There is massive famine and disease. It is one of the worst humanitarian crises, uh, crises ever uh, in history. Um, and the most fundamental point that I want to also drive home is this is a very, very nuanced uh, discussion. So I'm going to try to give you a neutral overview, roughly, without giving support to either side. Um, the reason I'm doing this isn't because I don't think there's a side that's correct, but it's because there. if I had to give the appropriate nuance to then tell you which side is more on the right, if we can even word it that way, um, I would have to be here for the next like eight hours telling you about this. Um, also, before getting into how horrible things are right now, I want to also talk about the beauty of Yemen. Yemen is not only a very beautiful country, um, it has uh, uh, amazing mountains, um, the uh, coastal areas are absolutely uh, beautiful, uh, they have islands like Sokotra and other islands which are basically heavens on earth, they look like paradise. Um, not only do they have this natural beauty, but um, their culture is beautiful. They have a, a heritage of um, uh, poetry. Their food is absolutely amazing. Yemeni food is one of my favorite types of food. If you haven't had the chance, please go and try to find a Yemeni restaurant near you. If you're in any large metropolitan city, there will definitely be a Yemeni restaurant somewhere around you. Please go have their fucking food. It's amazing. It's very homey and very filling, but still uh, um, pleasant. It doesn't make you feel like you want to die afterwards. Um, also, uh, historically, Yemen has uh, been a center for Islamic learning and has uh, produced many uh, Islamic scholars, uh, and that's adding to uh, just some of the v many, many merits that uh, Yemen has. Uh, and finally, which I think is the thing that's most striking, is the architecture. Yemeni architecture is very unique. Um, mm -hmm. Some people have called it, referred to it as the Manhattan of Arabia, which I really don't like that term, but it's a mm -hmm. good idea because it does look like Manhattan. Um, but uh, the difference is the Manhattan of Arabia existed for more than a thousand years before um actual manhattan uh, so uh, <laughs> it's a bit you know um but yeah the if you if you uh, don't know just go and look up uh, right yemeni architecture or yemeni buildings into google images and you're going to be str uh, stricken is that the word struck yeah <laughs> you're going to be struck mm -hmm. uh, by the uh, beautiful by saudi uh, multi, missile um, <laughs> Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, but you're going to be struck not by a Saudi missile, I hope, but by the uh, uh, beautiful um, multi story buildings that they build. Um, so, yeah, this is just a, a thing to, to humanize the people and the area and the culture and history before we get into. Just, the I, wanted, I, I don't know, JT, if you noticed it uh, when we were reading up on Yemen, but one thing that absolutely blew my mind, and now I'm talking to, uh, to Christians. Are there places where great grandchildren of Jesus ruled the fucking country? Uh, no, I haven't heard of such. Apparently, and he can correct me if I'm wrong. I never. How th does nobody know about this? For nearly one thousand years, Yemen was dominated by the Sayyid families, which were I fuck you not direct descendants of the Prophet. And ruled by like an imam or religious leader, but the, mm -hmm. the direct descendants of the greatest religious leader and I think it's correct to say founder of Islam mm. ruled the place. Like that's fucking yeah. crazy. That's so cool. That's it's so not, like yeah. wow. There's an <clears throat> there's an area in Yemen called Hadamot, and it has the largest. Um, uh, amount uh, of um, and hard, highest uh, density of people uh, who are direct descendants of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So um, that's wow, uh, really. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a range. The Yemen is incredibly so interesting. Yeah, I, not only do like so you can go, I sorry, you can go and shake a hand of, of, of the person who's a direct descendant mm. of the prophet. Wow, yeah. wow. no, so yeah. this planet is so Very cool. Sometimes yeah. it's so yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, sometimes. Sure. And I was just, again like uh, on personal notes. I've met many, many people. Yemeni people are absolutely lovely. They're incredibly, um, what's it called? Uh, um, they have a very strong guest culture, like most Arabs. But with Yemenis, is like extra. Um, and uh, they uh, are incredibly nice, very friendly people. Uh, I had, a, I knew a bunch of people that studied uh, medicine in Yemen actually, um, and then they were forced to either, either they finished before the war or they had to leave Yemen uh, as a result of the civil war, which is uh, a real shame. But they have nothing but good to say uh, about Yemen. I've personally wanted to visit many times, and hopefully, inshallah, when this thing finally dies down and there's peace again um yeah who knows maybe one day we're gonna do a, a episode in, in yemen, yemen. <laughs> <Fuck> yes, <maybe. laughs> who knows yeah, yeah who knows but anyways uh so let, let's get into the the history of it so <clears throat> i won't uh, dwell too much on the uh, ancient history but roughly Yemen for a long time has been semi-autonomous or semi-independent um, until around the 16th century, the Ottomans began to encroach slightly on Yemeni territory um, and they kind of took a bit and lost a bit and took a bit and lost a bit until the, like, what, 17, 1800s, uh, where they had a, a next to permanent presence uh, on Yemen. And then your favorite people, uh, the British, show up. Um, nice. Of course, uh, looking for spices because their food sucks. <laughs> and they, uh, <laughs> and uh, they uh, create this small protectorate in the area um and uh, this small protectorate eventually becomes like half the country uh and uh, a bit of other history you know back and forth between the ottomans and the english there's some fighting there there's some uh, treaties that are founded uh or uh, written and then finally in 1918 when the ottoman empire is basically dissolving um the northern part um that doesn't belong to the british uh is which used to be the the ottoman part becomes semi-independent um the the mutawakkilite uh, kingdom uh is founded in the area and this is the first i guess instance of some level of independence modern day in the modern uh, nation state idea for uh, yemen now uh, the importance at the time for the british was a couple of things number one the uh, ports it was incredibly important as i mentioned for trade and number two uh, for coffee now why is this interesting because yemen was the one of the first places in the world that cultivated uh, in fact it was the first place that widely cultivated coffee uh, in the modern way we drink it um and uh, for the longest time it was the sole producer on earth for coffee up until like what 200 years ago or so which is very very interesting um and this was as you may imagine a very lucrative um um, uh, business, so the the, the uh, English wanted a part of that as well. Um, as the English usually do, they came in and they drew borders, because that's what the fuck they do. Uh, and if you uh, ever look at British-drawn borders, they're always surprisingly straight, uh, <laughs> and that's no, there's no difference uh, between that and in, 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 in Yemen. Uh, when you look at the modern um, divisions of Yemen, between South and North Yemen, you'll see that they are al almost one-to-one -one with the borders that the British drew, and this is kind of a trend with almost everywhere the British go. Anyway, where they go and they drew, draw borders, they intentionally create the system for uh, civil instability for the next hundred years minimum. Uh, you see it in Nigeria, you saw it in Iraq, in Egypt, you see it everywhere um, that the British were. And Yemen is completely no different. Um, now, uh, as I mentioned, 1918, the this uh, formerly Ottoman part that is becomes North Yemen uh, gains independence as the Mutawakkilat Kingdom, um, and they end up having a bit of a war with Saudi Arabia in the 30s. Um, the reason this is important is because this leads to the Houthi thing I'm going to relate to later. Um, they have a little war uh, with, with the Saudis, and the Saudis completely decimate them. They beat them very badly, and as a result, this uh, fledging um, uh, nation-state uh, of Yemen has to cede a lot of territory to Saudi Arabia, um, which includes almost like half the size of modern day Yemen, almost, uh, that ends up being lost to Saudi Arabia. Um, this becomes important later on because the, there's a, some people with political aspirations to getting that land back nowadays. Um, anyways, uh, with all that said, that's the north taken care of. Uh, the south, uh, southern part, um, uh, which is be between uh, Aden and all the east, the desert area of um, uh, Yemen, uh, is a British so-called protectorate, in quotation marks, protectorate, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, until 1967. And now, did they as have, the British do... I'm going to interrupt. Did they put in uh, local, uh, let's not call them traders, but local... Mm -hmm. Pretty much, uh, yeah. People of pretty much, yeah. We, I think we can call them yeah. traders to to yeah. rule, or uh, or did they install their own people? 
they installed their own people. They did the Hong Kong thing where they just made it a completely British protectorate. Um, and mm, so uh, British uh, motherfuckers uh, ruling, uh, not okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, official they didn't colony, invent the king, the... you know. Oh, now there's a no, king no, of no, Yemen. No. Oh, he, he rules yeah, yeah, now. Yeah. Like okay. they did with Iraq. No, no, they didn't do that. <laughs> but yeah, um, and they it, there's even images. By the way, if you want to know how living memory this is, there are images of the current Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth, uh, the one who looks like a fucking skeleton. Um, who, by the way, I think she's probably dead now. They're keeping on life support. I don't know what's going on with her. Um, that woman, she's knighting the local traders that you know some tribal chiefs and shit like that. There's images of her, like photos of her knighting these these people. And if you look it up, uh, you'll even on its own even on the Wikipedia page, if I remember right. Um, so this is how close to living memory the the evil of colonialism is, uh, particularly for us in in the uh, formerly colonial or hey in some way still colonial countries. But you're completely right. Yeah, they did the same thing that the British always do. Um, they come in and then they make some local treaties and they bring a bunch of tribal chiefs together, uh, chiefs together, and they're like, hey, we're gonna give you a bit of money, we're gonna protect you, blah blah. Uh, and then they take over the whole thing and they just have some bullshit facade of of uh, legitimacy uh, on yeah, the and ground. And they give, they, they, the, they walk up to a single guy and they give him like a European styled brick and they tell them, yeah, <laughs> here. We have civilized you now. And they go home yeah, and the newspapers exactly. are like, no, we should not leave Yemen. I mean, we are civilizing them. You know, before that, they, they built house with sand, but now they built house with brick. Mm. Uh, <laughs> oh, we help so much. <laughs> oh, my favorite fucking yeah. argument. They civilized them. Yeah. Fuck, oh, classics. Exactly. Classics. Jesus Christ. Um, oh, no, it's the white man's burden, guys, please. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, did, what did Kipling say? Half devil and half child? Yeah, that's not fucking... <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Have you ever seen a white guy drunk? The, tell me what is half devil and half child. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, this, that was a direct attack. <laughs> you're I'm not wrong. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm slow, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Not white. But I'm you, kidding. You go, Nick, you're not white. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean the I, I, I look. It's a no, discussion. Yeah, no. go on. Habib, uh, you're, you're an Asiatic, a member of the Asiatic hordes. Okay, oh, yes. half Turk <laughs> and half whatever I'm else. Orc. An orc. <laughs> That's yeah. that. I never expected uh, Lord of the Rings references on a literal battlefield, but, but okay. Yeah. I, I'm going to give a, a very quick uh, overview now of the um, history of the nor North and South Yemen. Uh, I'm going to start with um, the, uh, what's it called, the southern part. That was the British uh, occupied part. Uh, so the Brits, whenever they come anywhere, of course, they burn cities and endlessly harass the local population to maintain their power. And they did this uh, with um, uh, with uh, Yemen as well. Uh, there is even footage to this day you can see of British soldiers beating the shit out of like Yom Yemeni kids and stuff. It's horrible. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, uh, they, they use this in a way to try to legitimize their power and scare the, the local population into obedience. Um, but they realized that, um, or basically the Yemeni people realized, hey, this is kind of bullshit. These people are in our country and they're, uh, well, you know, imperialist uh, pig dogs. <laughs> I don't know where the term pig dogs comes from, <laughs> I but it's know, a I love it. Yeah. But yeah, so we're going to we're gonna kind of kick them out. So they do something pretty metal called the Aden Emergency. Um, that's the official name. In history books, it's called the Aden Emergency. Uh, basically, what happened is uh, the people of Yemen or southern Yemen, the uh, Aden Protectorate, they got fed up, and they started two organizations, uh, one called the National Liberation Front, which was supported by Nasser's Egypt at the time, uh, and another one called the Front for the Liberation of Occupied South Yemen. So NLF and Flosi, uh, independently. Such um, complicated and... names. Like, who was doing these guys' <laughs> branding? Like, fucking hire uh, me, yeah. for fuck's sake. I wouldn't mind. What, you know. What's that going to be, like, my fourth <laughs> job at this point? Ah, Flosi. <laughs> yeah. Flosi. You're supposed to be afraid about Flosi knocking down your doors and getting in your house. Flossy, what are you, you gonna you know, floss Flo your teeth? <laughs> right, that, that's what I thought. Flossy is not that fucking. It's not. It's not that scary. But NLF, there's something a bit. You know, it's NLF. ambiguous enough that it's almost like in a weird, um, like a uh, dystopian American movie. It's called National Liberation Front. It's you know, it's just vague. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> there's not even Yemeni national. It's just National Liberation Front. Um, Jesus Christ. But anyways, yeah. So um, you have the, this, the NLF and Flosi. Uh, these two uh, ha carry out a long-drawn guerrilla warfare campaign from 1963 until 1967. Um, and I, between from like 1965 until 1967, they uh, have general strikes and mass, riot, uh, mass riots. They uh, blow up um, uh, military postings, British military postings. They blow up uh, military, um, like uh, British military aircraft in the sky. Um, they put grenades underneath wings and shit and then blow, uh, blow them in the sky very interesting stuff all good things whenever a, a, a colonial British officer dies I get, I get a little bit more happy um, and uh, <laughs> uh, they uh, eventually uh, in 1967 forced the British out completely so um, that and at that point you have something called the People's Republic of South Yemen that is uh, the southern Yemen part 
uh, liberated. Now let's talk about North Yemen. As this uh, turmoil is happening in the southern part, and the northern part of Yemen, uh, Yemen, the formerly uh, Mutawakkilite kingdom, uh, ends up having a Republican insurgency that arises, a, a revolutionary nationalist uh, Republican uh, insurgency, heavily influenced also by uh, Nasser's Egypt. So there's pan-Arab uh, influences, uh, like a pan-Arab idea, and of course this Republican idea that we, we don't want a kingdom, we, want, we don't want a monarchy, we want to have a democratic republic. So uh, they uh, fight the Mutawakkilites, um, and uh, they eventually uh, achieve um, victory. But this victory is incredibly pyrrhic. Is that the term in English? I believe it's a pyrrhic victory for the um, Egyptians because the Egyptians heavily supported uh, these North Yemen Yemeni Republicans to the point that uh, they almost bankrupted themselves entirely. Um, in also in history, they like to refer to it as Egypt's Vietnam, uh, which is less accurate because it happened be before the. America's Vietnam, so technically it should be v uh, America's Yemen uh, mm -hmm. instead of, but you understand what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So anyways, uh, with the victory in the um, late 60s uh, until 1970 of the Republican forces in North Yemen, you end up with two republics, the Yemen Arab Republic in the northern half, which is like northwest, uh, and the People's Republic of South Yemen in the south uh, east. Uh, of Yemen. Uh, and these countries, these two areas are still divided, but they always had the intention of unification. Um, now, something interesting happens in 1970. The, um, between 1967 and 1970, you have uh, this People's Republic of South Yemen, which is led uh, by a uh, force called the NLF, this one that I mentioned, the National Liberation Force. This had two aspects to it. One side was the Nasserist side, so pan-Arab and uh, more moderate in their socialism, and then the other one was a hardline Marxist, um, pro-Soviet, uh, and I think in some aspects also pro-Chinese um, uh, group. Uh, and there was a bit of struggle, as there usually is in these sort of things, and the Marxist uh, faction won out. Uh, and in 1970, with the victory of the Marxist faction, they renamed the NLF into the Yemeni Socialist Party, uh, which is basically a regular democratically centralist um, uh, Marxist, you know, uh, vanguard party uh, structure, basically. Uh, and they uh, found, or they, they renamed the country from People's Republic of South Yemen to the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen as a Marxist-Leninist uh, um, uh, Republic. And uh, like a, just a small point as well, um, the British, when they left, they tried to do something sneaky where they tried to create something called a Federation of Southern Arabia uh, as a kind of like proxy thing, like what Kuwait is nowadays um, in Southern uh, Yemen. Uh, so there would have been three republics, the Federation of Southern uh, 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 Federation of Southern Arabia, North Yemen, South Yemen, basically. But the South Yemenis uh, talked with the, these Federation people and united to to form the, the People's Republic of Yemen. That eventually became the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen, just in case somebody's like, oh, but you didn't mention this thing. Now you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there he is. So far, There's the lib. <laughs> yeah, the the, the, the the liberal on my shoulder. The fucking I see them in the room in the rooms. They crawl on the walls. Uh, but I was gonna say, uh, JT, did that make sense? The outline. Are you confused by anything? You're my resident uh... <laughs> resident idiot. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> heavy B. No, that Jesus, that the was amount good. of shit JT takes on this show, I I would not be able to. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so uh, thank you for that. Just so I can, uh, you know, um, uh, JT is going to be the, the surrogate for the audience in this case for questions or if I say something stupid or something complicated or confusing so that I can explain it. To there the we go. He just um, saved himself because he just gave a compliment <laughs> to JT because we consider our audience to be incredibly intelligent. So there we because go. They I'm are. doing my exactly part. Right. Now, um, before we talk about what's going on in modern Yemen, I want to talk a little, because we are, a, at the end of the day, a leftist podcast, I want to talk about uh, the socialism in South Yemen, uh, because some people will be interested in. Uh, sadly, there are there's basically no sources um, in English that are halfway decent um, on uh, South Yemen. In fact, some of the best reading on South Yemen uh, and its socialism is uh, declassified uh, CIA and, like, uh, State Department stuff, huh. um, if you want it in, in the English language. And even then, it's a bit off, um, but they have some interesting information. I'm not going to recommend anything, because there's nothing I know in the English language about um, uh, socialist Yemen specifically that I can recommend. Um, but I can give you a slight overview. Um, the uh, the socialism of uh, South Yemen was very ad hoc. Uh, now, what does this mean? It's, it was not as much a worker-led movement as we would hope it to be. Uh, in fact, I consider um, South Yemen to be in the same caliber of Romania and Afghanistan and their socialism. It's one of the uh, worst examples that, yeah, uh, or Bulgaria lesser decent extent. examples that we yeah. have. Yeah, exactly right. Um, there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, I'm not going to say that there was no worker um, involvement. Aden, which was an international port that, by the way, had um, the, o the only port city in the world that had more trade going through it was New York City at the time. Wow. 
Aden was the second one. Wow. Um, to give you an idea how much trade was going through Aden. And there used to be a massive, well, uh, worker um, presence there because they worked on the docks. And these people had um, uh, trade union uh, uh, built, trade unions built up, and they were one of the prongs uh, against the British uh, when they uh, tried to uh, eject the British from Yemen, etc., etc. So there was a worker presence there, and there was a worker presence in the government and the party. But it was not nearly as much as we would hope it to be. That's number one. Uh, number two, the... Uh, Public support of the Yemeni socialists was less than adequate uh, for a country that had, at the time, several million people. The party itself had a membership of just a few thousand. Uh, at its height, it had only 40,000 members. Uh, you can compare that with the current membership of the Chinese Communist Party, which is 100 million, um, wow. or even the the CPSU, uh, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which had uh, tens of millions at, at its height, had, I think, yeah, tens of millions of members. Um, you can compare that with Yemen, which had, like, at its height, 40,000, less than adequate. Um, but furthermore, also, uh, the Yemeni policies, which were decent, were the ones that you usually expect of socialism. They nationalized everything. They tried to collectivize agriculture and grow agricultures. They had good education policies and healthcare policies. Uh, they had semi-decent social policies. They did some good things for women, but there's also a lot of, like, weird... Um, anti-religious stuff imported from like Eastern Europe and, and the Soviet Union that the local population did not vibe with at all. Um, and you can see like year by year how uh, the, the Yemeni socialists were trying to get around this. Uh, it was very weird. Like one day, for example, they'd be like, uh, one year they'd have, for example, a national holiday for Ramadan and they would have, uh, you know, publications in, in like religious publications, newspapers and stuff like that, like relevant stuff. And then one year they're not even going to mention the fact that Ramadan is taking place. You know, like it's very weird and, and the local population was not receptive to this, this sort mm. of um, uh, uh, approach. Uh, and nor would I have been, by the way. Um, so uh, that was uh, another thing. And finally, another point is the Soviets, uh, just like the Chinese, both of them built quite a bit. For example, the national, um, the, the, the the airport uh, in, in Aden uh, is, uh, built, was built by the Chinese, uh, for example. And the Soviets gave them a lot of support. But also at the same time, the Soviets really liked Yemen because it was basically a Soviet naval port uh, in the southern Middle East. So they really liked that uh, aspect. And um, Yemen really did kind of feel like a proxy force for the Soviets at some point. I'm not saying entirely. Um, that would be unfair to the Yemenis. They had a lot of agency in their socialism. But at the same time, I don't want to paint like this, you know, rosy picture of, oh, it was exactly like Cuba. It wasn't. Um, it was definitely not an example of socialism. We should uphold that much. It's interesting to learn from, but just about that. Anyways, that's about uh, the socialism in South Yemen. Basically, um, it was semi-stable for the most part. They had two instances of basically almost civil war uh, and a few border conflicts with North Yemen, uh, which was not a socialist country at the time, um, or nor is it today, by the way. Um, but for the most part, their relations, North Yemen and South Yemen's, were pretty good, despite the fact, so it wasn't like North and South Korea, or North and South Vietnam prior, um, or East and West Germany, it was actually, for the most part, friendly, and they spoke quite a bit about reunification, even with one of them being explicitly Marxist, and one of them being explicitly not, um, but either way, uh, during the late 90s, after 1986, uh, there was a certain um, uh, instability in the government. Two different factions were basically fighting in South Yemen, uh, and uh, uh, this gave impetus, uh, renewed impetus to reunification talks, which went at a breakneck speed. Like, you see it being mentioned in 1986, and then in 1990, reunification happens. That is insane. Um, and I want to um, kind of give you an idea of what reunification is, um, because a lot of people haven't lived in divided countries that have been reunified, or countries that have hit, been hit by some, kind of like semi-civil war, and then, you know, the polit political system is reshuffled to almost be like uh, reunification. Um, the a similar parallel can kind of be drawn with East and West Germany, in in which that when West Germany and East Germany reunited, it was less reunification and more an annexation of by West Germany of East Germany. They mm -hmm. kind of just took it over and completely decimated the local political structure. Um, they fucked over basically the East German people and the East German uh, civil institutions um, and ruined lives and made people lose savings and and uh, like it was a horrible uh, way of going about reunification um, because that was their intention. They didn't want to go about it decently. Um, Yemen was kind of similar in that the um, Yemen, Arab, uh, Yemen Arab Republic, or North Yemen, was slightly more prosperous than the South because they had more of the agricultural land um, and they had a easier access to the Red Sea, etc., etc. Um, they also had some some uh, local ally, uh, uh, like support from Saudi Arabia and other kind of stuff, uh, and they had most of the oil as well. Um, so they were slightly more prosperous. And as a result, when they um, merged with uh, South Yemen, they... Uh, basically kind of did the same thing that the West Germans did with East Germans. They absorbed uh, South Yemen and they man maintained North Yemeni uh, economic and political and social supremacy um, for the most part, not entirely, for the most part. 
Now, as you may uh, assume, uh, this was a uh, not that appreciated by Yemenis, but they were willing to get make it work. They were willing to, to try at fixing because that, that was the talk. They're like, oh yeah, now there's some instability and it's a bit lopsided, but we're going to get to some level of equality. Um, th that was a discussion happening at the time. And then something called the first Iraq war happens. Yay, here's where I come in. <laughs> um, and with the first Iraq war, basically, uh, the US was pushing basically every country in the world to be like, yes, go, let's go invade Iraq um, in the UN. And Yemen was like, nah, I'm not feeling that actually. And they, mm. um, uh, uh, they had, um, uh, what's it called? Abstention? What, uh, what's the yeah. verb for, like ab abstained ab when you don't do abstained, drugs for a long time? Yeah, oh, exa abstained. exactly right. Because <laughs> abstention, <laughs> right? Okay. Yes, exactly right. It's two guys whose native English is not native and they are confused. And the third one who <laughs> is a native is too nice to tell them that their English sucks. And it's, this is <laughs> exactly what happens. Right. And that's why we love JT. That is why communism um, don't fails. Worry. Yes. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to fuck up an idiom here or there. Don't worry. Just, just you wait. <laughs> an idiot? <laughs> what yeah, it's, it's, what it's, idiot are you going to fuck up? <laughs> Let me join. Love fucking up idiots. Oh, yeah. Anyways, uh, the uh, Iraq war uh, thing, the, 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 the bids for the Iraq war, uh, the Americans tried to get Yemen to vote yes to it, and the Americans, they abstain a couple of times, and they finally they vote no. And uh, Yemen and Saudi Arabia are like, you know what? Fuck Yemen, because they did that. So they put uh, some, basically, sanctions on Yemen. They uh, uh, Saudi Arabia ejects, like, nearly a million Yemeni workers and students and stuff out of Saudi Arabia. Um, and basically, the this uh, post-Cold War Yemen is immediately thrust into economic insecurity and uh, political instability because of the actions of Saudi Arabia and the United States. So already you had some a, a fraught um, uh, relationship between di two different parts of the country, and now you add into the mix unemployment, low economic development, uh, social issues, political instability, etc., etc. As you can imagine, the South Yemenis start feeling a bit, you know, they're like, hey, this deal didn't work out in our favor. So in 1994, uh, they're like, you know what, fuck you guys. Civil war time. So <laughs> they um, they get armed and they uh, launch a civil war and it's uh, a decently bloody civil war that ends in two months with the, the southern movement uh, defeated. But the, they, the seeds that uh, they laid for a renewed bid for southern Yemeni independence uh, basically flourished up until today um, and uh, are, play a significant part in the modern civil war. Uh, so that's why, by the way, I'm giving all this background. You might think that's a lot. It's like, hey, you're almost an hour into the podcast. You haven't got into the meat of it. That's because there's so much to talk about. It's a very nuanced uh, discussion. Excuse me, please. Uh, but yeah, um, <laughs> with all this being said, after this 1994 civil war that fails after two months, um, there is basically like two decades uh, of uh, nothing really happening. There is economic instability. Um, there's political instability. There's not a lot of economic development. Um, there's illiteracy. Uh, there's not a lot of, lot of quote unquote social mobility, the, the term that the economists and liberals love. Um, and uh, th something happens in Tunisia in the uh, 2010s. Uh, something called the Arab Spring, something that was a colossal failure, <laughs> but whatever, that's a discussion for another time. Um, the uh, There were massive protests in Yemen at this time, so around 2010, 2011, massive protests all across Yemen against the... Um, ruling president at the uh, at the time, Ali Abdullah Saleh, who had been president at that point since 1978, by the way. Wow. Um, yeah, uh, so, you know, the, but no American, by the way, no American, uh, uh, what's it called, condemnation of, oh, you know, he has this authoritarian <laughs> under the thumb, but none of that bullshit, right? Because um, they don't care because he was an ally of theirs. Um, so uh, this guy who's been in power since 1978, basically, um, they want him out, the, the Yemenis. So uh, they uh, protest a lot, there's some riots, all that kind of stuff, and then finally, the... Uh, uh, there is some transfer of power from uh, this guy, Ali Abdullah uh, Saleh, to his vice president, uh, Abdul Rabu Mansur Hadi. And uh, Hadi, his, uh, he tries to do the, you know, he's like, oh, I'm going to come and I'm going to get rid of corruption and I'm going to fix the economic issues. I'm going to do that. protect the you know, national the interests and <laughs> yeah, classics. Yeah, yeah. The usual words. Bullshit, the I usual throw bullshit. words. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly right. But what's funny enough, it's like kind of the, the central government's fault, but also not, um, that uh, after this transfer of power kind of uh, doesn't really take place because uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, he doesn't want to leave. This guy does not want to uh, go out, really. Um, so this trans transfer of power is kind of fraught. Um, not only this, but during this period, there's worse social and economic issues. Uh, and then ISIS and Al-Qaeda... Uh, oh, fuck, uh, Al-Qaeda is the... <laughs> you said more times for the algorithm. Exactly. 
Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda. <laughs> Al Qaeda yeah, 9/11. Sorry, I, I, yeah, I said it uh, because I said it in like I, I started the pronunciation in Arabic and then I went English at the end. Um, the uh, fucking uh, in English you say Al Qaeda, which makes no sense. In Arabic it's Al Qaeda, which means the base. Um, you see, so, yeah. you see, anyway, listeners. So, uh, he knows like the the secret code way of saying it. That means he's a member. That's uh, <laughs> exactly right. The brain, exactly the right. brain of a um, superb yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly right. And then later on, a bit, a couple of years afterwards, ISIS becomes a thing. Um, so this is this increases tensions in Yemen. Uh, and then you get a new force that comes into power. Now, this force isn't really new. Uh, they had stuff going on for like decades prior. But uh, the they really come into the scene like what, 2014, 2015 with the Civil War. Uh, that's when like the world starts to know about them. They uh, are called the Houthis, but they didn't call themselves the Houthis. They kind of adopted the name now, um, but uh, they didn't call themselves that at first. Now, the Houthis are a um, influential tribe. It's a family in the northwestern part of um, Yemen. They're a Zaydi Shiite family, so they're different than the dominant uh, religious uh, sect that is within uh, Yemen, which is Sunni uh, Muslim. Uh, and they call themselves uh, Ansarullah, which is like um, the aides of, uh, or, or like the, the champions or helpers of God. Um, and uh, they uh, have differing, um, what's it called, goals. But, um, but how big is this tribe? F- like when we say tribe, I don't know, some people might think mm. 30 people, others might think 300. No, 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 thousands. We're, ta- we're talking about thousands of people. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, the under the leadership are, uh, of a specific family. Yeah, exactly. They're right. not yeah, all yeah, brothers yeah. So and sisters. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Yeah, yeah, basically. Uh, and uh, they are now currently the largest or one of the largest uh, players, uh, aside from the actual national forces uh, within Yemen. And their goals when they came to power were fairly generic goals. Uh, oh, development. We want to develop Yemen. We anti-corruption drive. We want to have an anti-sectarian republic with more democracy, autonomy for marginalized groups, um, etc., etc. The usual generic um, the goals. Uh, now, I'm not going to doubt the, the, the uh, what's it called, um, sincerity of, 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 of uh, their goals, um, but uh, th- they were g- fairly generic. That's just my point. Um, they also have something very famous about them, which is their slogan, which um, if the Al-Qaeda mentioning didn't get us um, uh, messed up, then this will definitely get us messed up. But I'll say it in Arabic, and then I'll tell you the translation, okay? So it's like in five pieces. So the first part is Allahu Akbar, then it's Al-Mawtu Amerika, Al-Mawtu Israel, Lana al Yahud, wal Nasr al-Islam. This is the entire thing. So the first part is Allahu Akbar, God is great, or God is greatest, the Islamic uh, slogan. Then afterwards, it's death to America, based. Then afterwards, it's death to Israel, beyond based. Then afterwards, it's curse upon the Jews, which is, whoa, okay, all right, not, not very based. <laughs> take, take, it <laughs> take it easy. Slow and down the last there, thing bucko. Is, <laughs> and then the last thing is victory to Islam, so beyond, beyond based. Um, <laughs> the, and then the, the, the podcast the, fell the, apart. No, it is also <laughs> Christianity, which is superior. No, it is McDonald's, <laughs> which is superior. And then we find... You're exactly. goddamn right. <laughs> JT oh. kneels before his his icon of Ronald McDonald and the bur- <laughs> what's the, 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 the hamburger what's the, yeah, the hamburger <laughs> <laughs> make, make yeah. Ronald Ekber <laughs> oh, Ronald <laughs> Ekber <laughs> Oh my God, coffee! No, and you have? Do you guys is, like you have communion in, in in the U.S. But you have like a KFC bucket. <laughs> he gives you and he gives you a biscuit with a bit of KFC the, gravy into on it. The grease and throws it at people. <laughs> yeah. oh, it, they they peel they, they they take they take the KFC chicken and they dip it in the gravy and then they're like, okay, the body of McDonald's. <laughs> body of no, it's, it's it's the body of Reagan. <laughs> That's the, oh God, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, like take sorry. one of the drumsticks and, and put a cross on your forehead with the grease. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I'm so sorry to the Americans that listen to us. <laughs> oh, it's all jokes. They know it's all jokes. Uh, anyways, so um, uh, back to point. Um, this, with the, the, the rise of uh, Al-Qaeda and ISIS and the local economic political instabilities and the failure of transfer of power and the rise of the Houthis, you have this perfect uh, mix, um, this, uh, what's it called, uh, this chili mix of, <laughs> of uh, ready completely for a civil war, which is exactly what happens. Um, so... Uh, as again, I mentioned with with the, this president that they want to leave uh, Saleh, um, he originally was against the Houthis, and the Houthis were against him, and they fought. But when Saleh realized, hey, um, the Hadi guy, my vice president, he's gaining a lot of power, and it looks like he's going to win this. Um, I'm going to ally with with the people that I I hated before. So he goes to the Houthis, and the Houthis come to him, and they're like, um, you know, my enemy, what's the fucking thing? The enemy, the enemy of my enemy, my enemy is my enemy. friend. Yeah. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Hey, an idiom I didn't fuck up for once. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they join forces, basically. And this turns out to be incredibly successful. Um, uh, the uh, This union that they have, by the way, uh, between Saleh and the Houthis would fall apart in 2017. And Saleh would be assassinated by the Houthis afterwards because he was like, you know what, I don't want to be with these people. And he goes to Saudi Arabia for talks and stuff like that. So they assassinate him. And then his forces that were loyal to him, then they join the central government. So now the Houthis are kind of on their own. Um but for between like 2015, 2014, 2015, and 2017, uh, Saleh, the, the president that didn't want to leave, and um, the Houthis were kind of together in this thing. So um, they fight together and they capture Sana'a, which was the capital of Yemen, which is a big fucking deal. Imagine if an insurgency group uh, captured Washington, D.C. It's a big fucking deal whenever the capital uh, falls to an insurgency group. Um, they, afterwards, um, slowly but surely, they make progress throughout the rest of the country uh, to the point that the central government moves from Sana'a to Aden, which was the former capital of South Yemen. And then afterwards, the uh, Houthi forces get very close to Aden and the central government is like, fuck this, and they leave and they go to Riyadh. So they go to the capital of Saudi Arabia, and they have been there since as a government in exile. Um, they don't actually rule within Yemen, uh, but they lead the local forces in, uh, in Yemen from, from uh, Saudi Arabia. Now, uh, the Saudis, this is where we finally get into what's going on. The Saudis, they feel this, right? And they're like, oh shit, so uh, to, our to our south, we have a neighbor that's incredibly politically insta uh, instable. They have Al-Qaeda presence um, that we may or may not have aided. Um, they have uh, ISIS presence. They have Shiite rebels. Um, and uh, Iran is kind of seeming friendly to these people. And we don't want a, a, a uh, Iranian proxy uh, to our south. So they're like, you know what? Um, we are going to start a coalition, a uh, coalition force of the Gulf, several Gulf countries, so Saudi Arabia, um, Qatar, uh, Bahrain, the Emirates, uh, Oman, uh, Jordan, and uh, Morocco and Egypt and a bunch of other countries as well, um, uh, to form this coalition to go to war. And they also impose a land and air blockade. So what does this mean? Land, meaning nothing can come in uh, via land, uh, so you can't bring uh, supplies into, into Yemen, and air blockade, so you can't fly anything in. Um, they have a few ports that are open, and the only reason they couldn't close those is because the, the Yemenis have control of those ports currently. But even then, they tried to do that a bit. Uh, so very severe blockade and a coalition, and then they go to war with mostly Western backing, um, with the usual way that Western countries carry out war, uh, which is just through uh, like airstrikes and shit like that. Not with that many boots on the ground. Um, the Saudis at first thought this would be a very quick war, um, as is the usual hubris of, of these type of powers. Um, they, th they thought they were going to be in and out. Uh, what did the... Uh, the Americans were, were, were saying about Vietnam, it's like, oh, we're going to be out before Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, exactly right. Same thing. Um, uh, so they're like, oh, we're going to be in and out. Uh, like it's a, you know, um, the, the, the Rick and Morty thing is like quick adventure, 20 minutes or whatever the fuck. Exactly that. <laughs> um, uh, so they uh, go into war and then they start getting bogged down in the war, right? Uh, the They keep striking uh, positions, some of them uh, military positions, a lot of them civilian uh, positions, some of them are weddings and, and schools and hospitals and like funerals and shit, really, really messed up stuff. Um, to the point that there is even a, uh, what's it called, uh, a database called the Yemen Data Project, which um, uh, has basically its purpose is to d document all the strikes that happen on Yemen. And they document which ones are military targets, which ones are on civilian targets, Targets and which ones are unknown, and it's almost it's very scarily close to 50% civilian targets, oh, almost always. Uh, and they have it broken down by the different um, governance of Yemen uh, and where they strike the most. And un uh, unsurprisingly, they strike uh, the northwestern most province of Yemen the most because that's where the Houthis have their uh, like core power, that's where they're stationed. Um, but yeah, uh, so uh, the Saudis go to war, as I mentioned, um, and this coalition is already fractured. Uh, they have some fractures with uh, Qatar, um, but that's not really very important. Uh, the big um, uh, one is uh, the Emirates. The Emirates and the, Saudi, uh, and the Saudis, they have a bit of a falling out in their coalition against uh, Yemen, uh, and uh, the Emirates pulls out their forces. From the coalition, but they still have some political allegiance to the coalition. But the, um, the, the they stop really giving uh, arms and, and and people like boots on the ground and stuff like that. Not only this, but they go against the Saudis by changing allegiances. The Saud, excuse me, the Saudis they uh, directly support the central government uh, of Hadi in Yemen, while the Emirates, they used to do that, and then they changed to support something called the Southern Transitional Council. Now, yay, let's make it even more complicated. <laughs> Remember that civil war that I mentioned in 1994 that lasted for two months that gave them this new impetus for a um, uh, southern uh, cessation movement within Yemen so that they can be a new, uh, an independent republic again of South Yemen? Uh, well, they never gave up on that uh, hope, and there are several movements that uh, rose up for secession, and the most solidified and organized one was the Southern Transitional Council. 
which for all Another intents and purposes name. is oh, yeah exactly yeah. just stc it sounds like a fucking what's it called like a std uh, <laughs> no no it sounds like a uh banzin what the fuck uh, where you um we put fuel. What the fuck is it called? Gas station. Gas station. Oh, gas Sounds station. like a fucking gas station. <laughs> <laughs> right? They're always three letter, you know? Uh, anyways. Um, so, uh, the um, what I was saying is, yeah, so the, the, there's this renewed impetus for, for uh, the uh, independence of South Yemen. And the Southern Transitional Council is one that has fighters on the ground. They have actual organization on the ground. And they have most of South Yemen underneath their control. Uh, and the UAE starts backing them. Now you're wondering, why would the UAE do this? Because capitalism. Um, the South Yemen has most of the port cities of Yemen. And as we mentioned before, Yemen is an incredibly important uh, trade outpost. So anybody who wants to come and stop by, they can stop by. And if they're going to stop by, they're most likely, 9 out of 10 times, going to stop by in a southern Yemeni port, right? So the UAE wants to move oil and they don't want to have issues with this stuff. So they do two things. Number one, they annex Sokatra, which is a... Um uh, island that belongs to, to, to Yemen, and they also um, support this STC, the Southern Transitional Council, so that they have unfiltered access to these uh, southern uh, ports, um, which is, yeah, very important. Um, by the way, also a, a interesting thing that I, I think most people don't know, um, JT, you know when you go to, um, what's it called, uh, when you go to, uh, what's it called, uh, the fucking coffee, Starbucks, um, mm-hmm. do you have a favorite order, per, per no, chance? No, I, I don't drink coffee, actually. Okay. Oh fuck. Okay. Then my my analogy was I was for, for l- hypothetically let's say that he enjoyed a mocha frappuccino, whatever the fuck a mocha frappuccino is. That's not real coffee. Okay, d- in my opinion. Um, but uh, that first part, mocha, comes from a port city called in Mocha in in Yemen, which hmm. is where the term comes from. Um, so not only is most coffee also from Yemen, or at least the originators nowadays, uh, coffee is grown all over the world. Um, but uh, many of the names that have to do with coffee uh, also relate to Yemen uh, specifically. And Mocha is one of these uh, port cities, uh, by the or ports. Um, just interestingly. Anyways, um, so this Southern Transitional Council, like I mentioned, they capture uh, Aden, they have most control over the southern uh, part of uh, Yemen, and uh, the uh, Emiratis are directly supporting them. Now, the Houthis, basically, um, they have control of this northwestern part, the what used to be the north uh, northern Yemen for the most part, um, and they're not doing a very good job of organizing anything, but it's not their fault, really, because of the um, severe blockades put on them, right? You can't, if you're in the middle of a civil war, and you have an air and a land blockade, it's hard to make sure that everybody's getting the food they need and clean water and stuff like that. That's not to absolve them of, of this, but you can't say that, you know, there's a lot of Western news outlets that are like, the Houthis have ruined Yemen because X, Y, Z, which is kind of uh, not fair to them, even if you don't want to be on their side. Now, the Houthis uh, have also uh, started carrying out attacks. I mean, they not only now, but back in, the, like, since 2015 on Saudi territory. What they would do is they'd fly drones and they would attack uh, oil outposts and, and uh, pipelines in Saudi Arabia. And they even attacked uh, the Emirates a few times. Um, with and the where help did of they get weird, their like, drones? Do you have any idea? Because it's um, obvious I where think, the Saudis get the drones. Yeah. Turkey? Um, I think they might get them from Turkey, but I think a lot of them are also, interestingly, like homegrown. Um, they have a uh, local industry, like Hezbollah type industry, mm. um, yeah, uh, for for developing those. But also, a lot of them are like weird, like you know, Pakistani surplus and shit like that uh, mm. that somehow finds its way into into uh, Ooh, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. They have really cool names like Slamad and stuff like that. They have in Arabic, uh, they have really cool names. Um, uh, but anyways, uh, they. Um, uh, they attack a bunch of uh, oil uh, facilities, refineries, and pipelines in Saudi Arabia, and this is very interesting because the Saudis are have a lot more to lose in this conflict than the Yemenis do, right? Um, because when you hit a pipeline, that's billions of dollars, of, if not uh, mil- uh, millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars worth of damage that are already caused. And then what are they going to do? Bomb another fucking village in Yemen? Like it makes little difference to the Yemenis at this point. Um, but uh, just so you know that they're not passive also in the war, they have some offensive capability that has somewhat increased recently. Um, Now, there's a lot of talk of, oh, this is a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran, which is not exactly right. Um, Sorry, I'm just going to rearrange myself. Um, is this is not exactly right because the first of all, like I mentioned, the um, this is based on a very simplistic understanding of the politics of the Middle East. They're like, oh, Iran is Shiite and the Houthis are Shiite, therefore they support each other. Um, they're two different sects of, of Shiism, number one, um, and number two, uh, Iran doesn't really have the capability to support Yemen all that much. Um, Iran is still very much a local power. They can support their you know stuff in Iraq because they can move stuff across the border into Iraq, uh, and Iraq is their direct ally, so they can move stuff into Syria, and Syria is their direct ally, so they can move stuff into Lebanon. Um, But for the most part, otherwise, uh, Yemen is more difficult to reach. 
So there is some aspect that is true, like uh, the Iranian uh, government has been positive towards uh, this Yemeni uh, insurgent group, but at the same time, I don't want to, you know, be like, oh yeah, you know, it's not uh, the proxy war that's painted out to be. Um, furthermore, uh, just an interesting, I think, uh, rounding up of, of the, the humanitarian cost, because this is usually cut out from these uh, discussions. The humanitarian cost of, of this civil war that's still ongoing has been tremendous. Uh, the amount of people killed as a result, as I mentioned, were, are between the tens and hundreds of thousands of people. Millions displaced, between three and four, if not higher, uh, million people have been displaced. Um, there are massive cholera outbreaks in the country, and this is especially painful because uh, Yemen was already a water insecure country. They have very difficult. Uh, they have a great difficulty get, uh, having access to fresh water, uh, clean fresh water. Um, so the few water reserves that they have uh, become uh, uh, hot spots for cholera outbreaks uh, to the point that it's I think in, 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 cholera has been endemic to Yemen forever basically, but uh, it's become the largest one of the largest outbreaks in the world of cholera. Um, which basically, if you're unaware, cholera is one of those diseases where you have diarrhea until you die. Basically, it's uh, um, you lose tremendous amounts of water, you dehydrate it to the point that you can even die, um, and this is. Uh, something that isn't difficult to treat if you have access to a modern uh, medical care system. But Yemen sadly does not have that. The vast majority of Yemenis don't even have access to local clinics, let alone hospitals or, or, or uh, uh, ambulance uh, services. Um, and then on top of that, you're uh, in a war. Exactly Perfect right. This combination. Is a uh, furthermore, there's uh, severe famine. Um, this is for several reasons. Number one, Yemen has very bad agricultural land as a result of several factors. Uh, overgrowing is one. Another thing is there, there's something called khat, which is a um, uh, a uh, like a, a plant that you chew on as it has like psychedelic stuff and it's uh, grown as a drug in, in Yemen uh, and it uh, takes up a lot of arable f uh, farmland. Um, also mismanaged by the government and of course the war. So this is a famine. Uh, and also, um, what's it called? Um, Humanitarian aid can't really reach them very easily. Uh, another problem is unemployment, which is around 75% uh, in Yemen. Even before the civil war, uh, unemployment was very, very high. Uh, poverty rate of around 50%. Malnutrition rates around f uh, 50%. Um, the literacy rates also are abysmal. Um, so uh, Basically Florida, the, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and of course, all this is made worse by U.S. aided strikes on civilians that I, I mentioned before is documented by the Yemen Data Project. And you can uh, look them up on the website. They are incredibly detailed uh, if you're interested in this. Now, let's mention why. Why is this happening? Why is uh, why did Yemen have such a hard time after 1990, after the unifica reunification, to become a decently developed country that can take care of their people? Um, and it's the usual reasons that you expect. There is a post-colonial country forcibly underdeveloped by a colonial force. And then afterwards, uh, IMF gets the IMF uh, gets its claws into it and doesn't let go. Um, basically, what happened is post 1990, uh, Yemen took a bunch of loans from the IMF and they couldn't pay them back. Um, and as a result, the IMF comes in and does what they do best, which is, hey, you know what? Um, restructure completely. Um, we want you to uh, privatize stuff and let us own it. Uh, we want you to lift fuel subsidies, which, by the way, the vast majority of the population rely on. As I mentioned before, Yemen produces uh, natural gas and oil, so they can actually have a very easy time with electricity and powering stuff if they wanted to. But the thing is that um, before they used to, the state used to subsidize them, so the prices are very low, the IMF came in and was like, lift these fuel subsidies. So now people can't run generators to run their uh, electricity for their homes or their shops and their tools. So then they're limited in economic pros prospects. So then they're forced into basically subsistence farming or other bullshit uh, that it can't really develop the country beyond a, a decent level. It keeps it heavily impoverished. It's again the Parenti thing that's a, it's like the Congo is rich, the Philippines is rich, Yemen is rich, but it's forcibly underdeveloped and kept poor by uh, imperial powers uh, and their uh, other you know uh, arms, which include the IMF and World Bank, etc., etc. Um, furthermore, um, they... Uh, is uh, there is significant foreign instigated instability in the region different uh, uh, factions are supported by um, powers outside of Yemen that also benefit from this uh, instability uh, and already a complex political landscape uh, that existed within the country one of the, it's the poorest country in the region it's the poorest Arab country uh, and one of the poorest countries within the region um, they had no industrialization even the southern uh, socialist ruled Yemen had some level of industrializa industrialization that has practically entirely been uh, stripped bare uh, with these uh, two, three decades since. Um, and, uh, of course, the aforementioned IMF and World Bank and all that kind of stuff. Now, what is the future uh, looking like for Yemen in this case? Uh, the 
there's some there's some positivity. Uh, I don't want it to be all like uh, bleak. Uh, in 2021, or I think it was uh, December, so just a couple of months ago now, actually, uh, there was the signing of the Riyadh Agreement uh, in Saudi Arabia, in which Hadi, the vice president, uh, that this you know the transfer of power to him was like one of the big deals of the, of the civil war. He resigned completely. He's like, fuck this, I'm out. Uh, and uh, he called a new cabinet to be formed. Uh, there was a formation of a new government that includes the STC that we mentioned, the Southern Yemeni uh, secessionist part. They have given uh, political power in this new government scheme. Um, they have agreed to, um, in, in, at least in the, in the, the um, agreement, uh, there are clauses for uh, the disarmament and integration of all these differing militias and military formations in Yemen. Uh, and uh, not only disarmament, but integration of them under the Ministries of Defense and the Ministries of Interior, um, the support of Yemeni economy by like any uh, uh, monetary support and stuff like that, uh, and, and reorganization, stuff like this. And, and of course, the demilita demilitarization of Aden, which is uh, interesting because Aden has always been a hot spot for, for um, uh, uh, um, insurgent activity uh, because it's right in the south of the country. It's the largest port. It's incredibly vital to the country. Um, so whoever captures it kind of captures all of Yemen. Um, so they want the entire place to be demilitarized. Um, currently, as as of the recording of this, uh, we are in a two-month truce that is in honor of Ramadan. Um, and uh, so far, it's been kept up. It's We're almost done with Ramadan now, alhamdulillah. And, um, Didn't they hit like a few spots in Saudi Arabia, though? Like, I don't know, yeah, a month ago, a few oil depots. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. But that was uh, prior to, to, to the truce that was signed now. Oh, um, yeah. But yeah, they, Christian they have had. Yeah, uh, it was before <laughs> Ramadan. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, no, it's completely fine. But yeah, so uh, they uh, there's this two month truce in all of, uh, in all of Ramadan right now, and so far everybody's been sticking to their word, which is very nice. There has been uh, the longest period of peace in years so far, um, and uh, inshallah this stays. Uh, and of course, my heart n not only as uh, a Muslim and an Arab, but as a Marxist and as a human being, goes out to the Yemeni people and their struggle um, for such a wealthy and rich uh, and interesting land uh, for them to be uh, tried with these. Uh, basically well these these trials and tribulations um and to see them being meddled with and 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 uh, murdered and uh, uh basically uh, fucked with <laughs> that there's no better <laughs> way, way of saying it right is is painful to see and also uh, kind of uh, brings you brings your opinion of the international community mm. uh, down a bit because uh, with all this talk about ukraine for example not to drag away from that of course what's happening in ukraine is deserves uh, um attention but when you compare it to what's happening in yemen there's scarcely a report if there even is a report um yeah with that said, though, um, I guess that's the end of my lecture. I, I can recommend some <laughs> some <laughs> some further reading for people who are interested. Um, as I mentioned before, Yemen is very hard to find decent sources on in English, but there's a couple of books that I can recommend um, that uh, you can read up about. If you want to read about uh, read up about socialist Yemen, a decent-ish book is one titled "Yemen Divided: The Story of a Failed State in Southern in South Arabia," which is uh, halfway decent. Otherwise, on Yemen in general and particularly this war, uh, there's a book titled "Yemen in Crisis." The Road to War, that's one that I recommend. Another one is Yemen Endures, Civil War, Saudi, Saudi Adventurism, and the Future of Arabia. And finally, the last book is Tribes and Politics in Yemen, A History of the Houthi Conflict, which is much more in-depth. All these books are half-decent. None of these are excellent covers of the situation, but they will give you enough information so you can be educated on the topic. Um, yes. <laughs> wow. Thank that you, Professor so Hakeem. so interesting. <laughs> Questions, <laughs> students? <laughs> uh, yeah. So this particular conflict, like a lot of times it's very easy to reach for the conclusion that, oh, this is just a, another proxy war. But that doesn't mm. really seem to be super applicable in this case. This one seems mm. a lot more chaotic. Um, yeah. How much of it would you say is proxy war and how much is this long historical struggle? I would say it was more it's a bigger proportion a large histor larger historical struggle and a smaller proportion i'm not going to say it's it's uh, minuscule but a small proportion is that of a uh, basically you know uh, a proxy war but again the the talk of oh it's the iranians mm -hmm. the shiite iranians supporting the shiite yemenis versus the sunni uh, uh, you know like again because there's a diff the the uh, uh, sunnis or the the ruling government within Saudi Arabia uh, and their brand of Islam is very specific uh, it's a very specific kind I don't want to say Wahhabi it's more like 
I don't want to also say the Nejdi stuff. It gets very complicated, but they have a different uh, perspective on these, and the Sunnis of Yemen also have a very different perspective, um, mm. and they don't see eye to eye. Um, likewise with the Shiites of uh, Yemen and the Shiites of Iran. So to be like, oh, you know, it's these Browns and their religious all uh, allegiances is a very, um, uh, what's the term in English? Um, reductive, oh, overly simplistic. Reductive. Exactly. Yeah, you, you took the words out of my face. Exactly. Reductive and overly simplistic. <laughs> uh, simpl simpl sub fuck, simplistic, yes. <laughs> <laughs> <Can't help. laughs> Thank you. Uh, for people listening, by the way, again, uh, I don't, I'm not an expert on Yemen. Uh, I just, you know, I, I did, I do my reading. I know uh, Yemeni people, and I've never been say that. Otherwise, like, oh, I have like, every fucking episode. We are a podcast. <laughs> We're experts in absolutely everything. Trust all That's of true, our exactly. opinions. We're a bunch I of dudes everything. with microphones. Yes. That means that everything we say is gospel. I am the sole authority. If you if you destroy that illusion. Nobody listens. So we know absolutely everything. Content creators <laughs> on the internet should run your life. You should have a podcast you listen to to give you political opinions. A online Instagram model to tell you how to fix up your body. Uh, every, every single aspect of your life should be dictated by random people on the internet. Don't you know that, Hakim and JT? Jesus. Yeah, no, you're completely you're right. Fucking boomers. So stupid, man. Yeah. It's so right, yeah. As I was always saying, the General Secretary of the United Nations, they come to us and they're like, hey, deprogram, what do you guys think about this conflict? <laughs> you joke, what do you but think if the they did, are? we would probably do a better job. With yeah, honestly, respect. honestly, fuck me. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what more to say. Um, there's a couple of things I missed out that I would love to talk about in future episodes, but we don't have time for. Um, the adventure of Egypt in Yemen is so interesting and so um, like not spoken about or lightly sp uh, uh, spoken about. Uh, that we can do several episodes on, but maybe hopefully in the future we might do an episode or two on it. Also, the support of Egypt for um, Marxist movements, uh, Marxist guerrilla movements in Oman and Saudi Arabia and shit like that. There's like crazy shit that happened in Saudi Arabia that is very, very interesting um, that I would love to, to, you know, I've been mean to make a video about it for forever, but yeah, I, I just never get around to it. Um, but yeah, so there's much more to talk about as well. Uh, yes. Lovely. Well, that was super interesting, especially for someone who whose only experience with, with Yemen has been Bernie uh, <laughs> saying things about it every once in a while. Um, so that was super interesting. And if you guys uh, listening like this episode, definitely let us know uh, either on the, the Reddit or in the Discord, if you're in the Discord. Um, definitely let us know what you think of, of uh, Professor Hakim's lecture <laughs> series here. And we can definitely do more of them because <laughs> it's nice. We can sit back and relax while Hakim does all the work. <laughs> we can also if, if be he... lecturers. Come on, JT, you yeah. know, himself. We can, uh, you know, and then uh, Hakim can give me some karma on interrupting me all the time with uh, very <laughs> uh, low IQ jokes. So, yeah, and I can um, do exactly uh, right. I can do a Marxist analysis of uh, Trailer Park Boys. I was gonna be like, you can do a deep dive into uh, the, uh, the a Marxist analysis of um, the RB Nuggets versus <laughs> Wendy Nuggets. Oh, RB <laughs> doesn't do nuggets. <laughs> which oh. which which one is the which one is the food of the masses? I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm just making a joke about Americans not having culture. Please, okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, actually, right, you no. Do, you, you, we, you have a very original, beautiful culture built on. Uh, a mixture of many other cultures, etc., etc. Et <laughs> yeah. On the ruins and skulls of other do, cultures. <laughs> I'm sorry. <It's> like <laughs> everything we listen to, you, everybody makes fun of uh, like non-American cultures. So you could call it like an ego trip for me and uh, Hakim here, who uh, you know use our use our time on the microphone to shit on you guys as uh, not shit on you, but like make fun of you as much as possible. Yeah, no, even are, even the, the most left wing, all, yeah. like even like properly radical fucking podcasts, very often I'm listening to them and they're taking a shit on my part of the world. I'm like, mm. okay, I'll I'll take the joke, but then you guys better take the joke when uh, the chairs mm. are reversed. <laughs> yes, all yeah. in good fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All these are jokes. JT is a good sport. We're all good sports. We're all laughing about this. But don't take this. Uh, uh, all that bullshit. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but actually, on, on a yeah. much, <laughs> yeah, but much, on a much more serious note, uh, some things I would love to see JT um, lecture on would be the. Uh, uh, leftist movements within the U.S., mm. um, part, like, for example, um, the trade union movement and what happened to that, for example. That's yeah. incredibly interesting because there used to be a point in American history, JT knows much better than I do, uh, of, of actual union membership in the United States yeah. of, like, a decent percentage. And now you're standing at, like, what, 11%, I think? Yeah. <laughs> Something pathetic. ridiculous like that. <laughs> it's yeah. really sad. So, <laughs>
and how something like this can happen and like uh, th th that is incredibly interesting we could do a whole episode but the the format today of more lectury let us know um if you liked it how we can improve um and exactly how jt said uh join the subreddit because uh, last time we shouted out there was like 300 people that joined so we're now almost at a oh, thousand wow. people yeah so keep joining it and keep posting pictures of what of, of, of uh, hakim and uh, of hakim of you and i um <laughs> 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 every once in a while it's like uh, yeah the latest pictures of you up that they put up were beautiful gorgeous um, really i didn't see uh, them fuck okay you should check it out they're funny <laughs> um that is uh, also and uh, of course a uh, shout out to all our patrons thank you very much we would not be able to do this without you guys i always reemphasize this most of us work day, day jobs as well um so this is something we do on the side we would not be able to do this if it wasn't for your support so we are very 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 thankful to all our patron supporters um and uh, yeah and for anybody listening as well do support, take a look at our Patreon and support us. Why not? Uh, you'll be getting a bunch of cool stuff, um, uh, bonus episodes uh, and uh, live uh, episodes with us. Um, you can, uh, like, we have once a month Discord calls as well uh, that we do with the uh, people of a certain tier uh, and we just chat, you know, shoot the shit as Americans say um, and sometimes have very interesting conversations. Last time we were talking about um, what's it called? Uh, a political organization in the U.S. And we were talking about uh, like active organization. It was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Uh, and other times we talk about I don't know, like movies we don't like. It's uh, <laughs> always a <laughs> good true. time. And with all that said, this has been fuck me. This has been the D program. <laughs> I'm Hakeem. <laughs> I'm JT. I'm Ugopnik, and I will fuck you. <laughs> yes. Tell me, tell me about those Arby's nuggets. <laughs> <laughs> they all have nuggets. They have the meats. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs>